City Clerk, can you please take the roll? Yes, Alderman Rainey. Here. Alderman Fleming. Here. Alderman Fisk. Here. Alderman Braithwaite. Here. Alderman Wynn. Sorry, Alderman Wynn, I'm not. Oh, uh, Alderman Wilson. Here. And uh, Alderman Ruth Simmons. Here. Alderman Suffredin. Here. And Alderman Ravel. Here. All right. Thank you, Clerk Reed. We have all of our aldermen here tonight, so we have quorum. Uh, Alderman Wilson, could you move a motion that we can have this meeting electronically? Yes, I move that we suspend the rules to allow us to conduct the meeting utilizing the Zoom video <coughs> conference software in lieu of an in-person meeting and in accordance with the governor's prior directives related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Second. Second. All right. Thank you. City Clerk, could you take the roll, please? Alderman Rainey? Here. Yes. Alderman Fleming? Aye. Alderman Fisk? Aye. Alderman Braithwaite? Aye. Alderman Wynn? Aye. Alderman Wilson? Aye. Alderman Ruth Simmons? Aye. Alderman Suffredin? Aye. Alderman Ravel? Aye. And I'm sorry, that was the last one. Okay, thank, thank you, Clerk Reed. Uh, so we have moved a motion and it passed the Evanston City Council to allow us to have this meeting virtually. Uh, and again, once the uh, pandemic is contained, uh, we at some point will be able to go back to having in-person meetings and uh, seeing everyone. I'm not quite sure exactly when that will be, uh, but that's the reason that we passed that, that motion to allow us to have this virtually uh, per an executive order issued by the governor. Uh, so welcome everyone. Today is the uh, Monday, February 22nd, uh, 2021 Evanston City Council meeting. Uh, just prior to this meeting, we had both the Administration and Public Works uh, Committee meeting and then the Planning and Development Committee meeting. Um, couple announcements um, today. Uh, first off, uh, a big event happened in the last two weeks uh, that has actually impacted our ability to uh, get vaccinations out. Uh, and that is 18 inches of snow that fell here uh, last weekend. Um, and I just want to uh, give a shout out to our entire uh, snow removal team here at the city. It literally has been a 24 hour operation with people working 12 hour shifts. Um, and, uh, and I think they've done a terrific job, uh, and removing snow is not easy, uh, especially this much snow, which required us to do nighttime removals of it and have trucks in there. And I know that was loud and noisy, uh, for neighbors, but I appreciate all the good work of our city employees uh, and the adaptability as always of our residents here in Evanston. Um, today, the big news, um, uh, if you're following national media is that we are approaching half a million uh, fatalities because of COVID-19 uh, in the pandemic. And um, I have a proclamation today, and this is cur courtesy of Mary O'Connor, uh, a resident here, um, who uh, came to me and came to Alderman Ravel and uh, brought to us a national movement that's going on to recognize the fatalities. Uh, as everyone knows, just before President Biden was elected, we had the lights uh, display that occurred all across the country. Uh, and we participated here in Evanston. We received a lot of feedback uh, from families here that, uh, that really appreciated that. And so Mary O'Connor came to us uh, with this national uh, recognition of the floral heart display. And so I am, and it's a Memorial Day, for those that have passed away because of COVID-19. So I am issuing a proclamation for that. I'm gonna read the proclamation, it's pretty short. Uh, and then I wanna give a couple minutes to our resident, Mary O'Connor, uh, to just share uh, what's actually gonna be happening here uh, for a few days. So uh, with that, uh, let me read the proclamation. Again, it is COVID-19 Memorial Day, whereas the first Monday in March has been designated as COVID-19 Victims and Survivors Memorial Day, and whereas COVID-19, SARS-2019, 
COV-2, uh, the technical name, uh, is an illness caused by a virus that can uh, transmit from person to person and has spread across the world, creating a global pandemic that is having catastrophic effects on human life, our community, and our economy. And whereas local and state governments, health departments, and public servants have been have taken bold action to protect residents, support struggling local economies, and find innovative ways to provide services. And whereas in response to rapid spread of COVID-19 and stay at home orders, essential workers have stepped up to provide critical services to help protect our communities and save lives, sacrificing their own health and safety. And whereas each life lost to COVID-19 mattered and leaves a hole in the hearts of loved ones, family members, and surrounding communities. Now, therefore, I, Stephen Howard Haggerty, the mayor of the city of Evanston, Illinois, do hereby proclaim the first Monday in March, 2021, which is next week, as COVID-19 Memorial Day in remembrance of those who have lost their lives and in honor of those who are forever marked by COVID-19 and continue to suffer the impacts of this virus. Here in Evanston, we've lost 110 residents uh, to COVID-19, to COVID uh, again, in over half a million uh, in this uh, country uh, is going to occur sometime, I believe, this week, um, they think. So um, with that, I'd like to introduce Mary O'Connor uh, and just have Mary uh, say a few words about uh, the floral heart display and what's going to occur around town. So welcome. I see you on the screen, Mary. Welcome. Thank you very much, Mayor Haggerty. I really appreciate the opportunity. And I want to say a quick thank you to everybody who has been so supportive of this project since we started working with the city of Evanston. And I'm very proud of my hometown to be one of the first to sign on to this resolution. The resolution comes from the group marked by COVID, a group of volunteers and activists around acknowledging and helping those who have lost from lost relatives and loved ones from COVID. Uh, I think we're all really aware of the pain and the loss this pandemic has brought so many people in our country. And I have become aware that grieving at a social distance is a very difficult thing to do. And so a lot of people are delaying grief or their grief is disenfranchised. So I think everything we can do to reach out, to comfort, to support is important at this time. Every one of those numbers, every one of that 500 number is a name, is a unique life. So. I thank you for what you've done. I thank everybody at the mayor's office. You've been so great to work with the downtown Evanston, the International Rotary Club, Alderman Ravel, um, Christine at the National Alliance on Mental Illness has been extremely helpful too. So I wanna say a special shout out to Justin Wynn Leadership Academy. They're adding a really wonderful element to the location in Evanston. Where is this gonna happen? So this is on March 1st. Most of the installations across the country will go in towards the end of the day between 3 and 5 p.m. Uh, and they will usually stay in place for three days. So we urge people to go visit on their own time to take the moment of contemplation for the loss that we've all suffered. In Evanston, uh, we have wonderful support from and we will be located at Amita Health St. Francis and North Shore Evanston Hospital in their atriums on the main floor. Uh, if you the, if you are so inclined to go to the Chicago installation, that will be at Buckingham Fountain. Um, we ask everybody, if you are going, please follow the CDC protocols. We are gonna be enforcing masking and distancing, of course. And if you wish to follow the activity on Instagram that day, we're going to be under the hashtag, um, hashtag floral heart project across the United States. Um, with that, I just want to say thank you and that everybody's support has been so heartwarming and so meaningful to everyone who has lost someone during this past year. Thank you, Mary, and thank you for, for all that you're doing, um, not only in Evanston, but I think in other, other communities, but bringing this forward uh, to, um, to Alderman Ravel and I. Um, Lots of things that happen here in the community aren't because, you know, some alderman or the mayor an initiated it. It's because of the, the great residents and former residents that we've had here that come to us. So thank, thank you for that, Mary. Um, speaking, of, speaking of grief um, and uh, the difficulty of mourning at a time when we can't all gather, uh, we lost a really well-respected um, community member uh, last week. Uh, who many people know, and that's Kate Mahoney. 
Um, and Kate was a fixture. If you went to events and everything, you'd see Kate. She made a huge difference in people's lives. She worked for peer services for 30 years. She was the executive director of peer services for 25 years. If you're not familiar with peer services, you know, it's a robust organ or robust organization that provides high quality substance use prevention and treatment services uh, to Evanston and neighboring communities uh, across Northern Cook County. Um, and, uh, and Kate just fought tirelessly uh, to fight against the stigma, made uh, contributions locally and nationally. Um, excuse me, her, her pioneering work in youth prevention and her tireless fight against stigma made her contributions locally and nationally, setting the standard for important work that continues to this day. Um, so our thoughts and our prayers are with uh, Kate's entire family and all of, all of her friends on her, on her passing. Uh, lastly, I just want to give a quick update on um, COVID-19 and vaccinations. Um, the numbers on COVID-19 continue to look pretty good here in Evanston. Uh, today, we only had four new cases. Uh, and um, bringing our total case count to a little over 3,800. Uh, our positivity rate's 2.69%, so that's higher, I think, than the last time we met. Um, but our seven-day moving average is only eight cases uh, a day right now. Um, our seven-day positivity is actually sort of close to where the state positivity rate is, um, which normally we've been below that. Um, but I don't see anything here and haven't heard anything from our health department that, that concerns us. Um, key thing is to, again, continue to follow the protocols, even if you are uh, have been vaccinated, to maintain social distance, wear a mask, um, you know, avoid congregating with large groups of, of people. Uh, in terms of in terms of vaccinations, uh, Evanston and the state of Illinois is no different than other states this past week uh, that saw the number of vaccines uh, that were distributed to us go down because of the snowstorm and the ice storms all across the country. Uh, they had challenges uh, getting those. Uh, we continue to be told that we should see quantities increase uh, come March. Um, there's been a big effort here in Evanston to um, vaccinate the congregate home uh, facilities of uh, old, primarily older Evanstonians here that were not part of the CVS Walgreens part partnership. Uh, so uh, recently we've done four of those. We've got two more to go. Uh, I was at uh, the Housing Authority of Cook County uh, Walchurk facility with uh, President Preckwinkle and others this morning. Uh, they, the folks that live there were getting vaccinated. And then tomorrow, the folks at Perlman, uh, which is the other Housing Authority of Cook County, are getting, are getting vaccinated. Um, uh, Amita St. Francis is helping us uh, do vaccinations coming up this week. Um, with the Pfizer uh, vaccine. Uh, this week, we're going to start to vaccinate folks that are 71 years old and older. Uh, there's going to be events Wednesday and Thursday this week. We'll also be doing second dose events for people that have gotten first doses. Uh, overall, uh, you know, the numbers we've had 12,005, or this is I'm rounding here, but about 12,500. Uh, doses distributed to Evanston, about 6,000, a little less than half of those went to healthcare workers, uh, leaving us with uh, 6,500. We're expecting uh, a little more than 1,000 additional ones this week. Um, so of those, uh, or a little over 80% um, have gone to vaccinate people 72 years and older. Uh, the others have gone to essential or critical personnel, to the to some congregate homes that I mentioned, uh, as well as a small number to educators. Um, so that's that's where we stand uh, with vaccinations. Again, the biggest challenge continues to be a supply issue and just getting more uh, quantity of vaccine. It is not an issue of um, moving the um, uh, moving the vaccines out. I think we can move the vaccines out pretty quickly. Um, once we get our hands on them. Alderman Wilson, uh, Alderman Suffern, I mean. Yeah, um, I had uh, sent an email to Erica and Ike asking about how we're prioritizing staff. Do you know where we are on staff vaccinations uh, relative 
uh, to the total number of staff that we have? Yeah, I don't, I don't have that number, Alderman. Um, the number right that I just said is about 80% of those vaccines that didn't go to the health care have been, have been um, put in the arms of 72 and above. I don't have the other. We can get that information for you, though, I'm sure. Are you, are you aware of any elected officials who should be 1C who receive vaccination? I'm not. I, I mean, just to, if, if people are asking, I have been vaccinated as part of 1B. Um, because everybody that was part of the emergency operations center, and I'm a member of the unified command was vaccinated, but I'm not, I'm not aware in terms of other elected officials, um, unless they were over the age of, you know, 72, they would have been vaccinated. Okay. Is that determination made by the health director or the city manager in terms of who should be vaccinated? Uh, yeah. So it's all the health, it's all the health director. Um, so Ike Ogba, who I don't think is with us tonight, um, that does this. But we can answer these questions if you want at the next council meeting, or I can have them send an email out yeah, to you. Uh, yeah, I sent an email yesterday and just haven't got a response. Um, but, but thank you uh, for, your, for your answer. You bet. Okay. Uh, Alderman Fleming. Yeah, I have a quick question about the Amita piece. Um, is the goal that we will have Amita and Levy Center run at the same time, both serving the same age groups? So what I can tell you about that is that um, the, the, of the two vaccines, the Pfizer is a more complicated vaccine to administer. Um, and so the recent dosages that we received were, um, um, were Pfizer. And so that's why they, they turned to Amita St. Francis, because they said, hey, we want to partner and help. So, I know they're doing ones this week that are going to be, what did I say, 71 and older. I know that's going to be Amita St. Francis. If you're watching this, you're still going to get notified by the city. You're not going to necessarily know it's Amita. They'll just tell you where to go and it'll be at probably Amita's facility. I'm not sure, Alderman Fleming, about um, the second dose events that are going to occur this week. I imagine that will be at our community center that we've been using and that'll be administered by the city staff. Okay. And then one thing, I, I, I think you mentioned Ike maybe wasn't here, but one suggestion that I requested um, was if, and I know he doesn't send out those, you know, emails to citizens to have them sign up until he knows he has how many vaccines are coming, but maybe if there was an email that went out even to council, because I get, as we all do, a lot of questions saying I'm 21, you know, I'm 62, you know, whatever. And instead of, I know one time my 311 was really overwhelmed. And then we made that other email address, but I don't know how fast that is. But if we could just get an update, even on Monday, Sam, we're in this age group, that would be helpful because those are easier questions that I think we can all answer as council. Then we don't have to be sending so much stuff to Ike. Um, I, th I think that's a great idea. Um, I my father, who's, you know, 68, I ended up taking him very far outside of town just because he has some breathing issues. And you all know he's been home with me. Yep. I've been you know, home. So, I, I just didn't know when we were getting to his age and it became a little bit of a health risk with teenagers yep. going out of the house for myself. So I understand people's concern. I'm trying to take as much work off of Ike with those small questions as I can. So that would yep. be good if we could just have an update somewhere of the age group. Absolutely. So I'm going to ask Erica if you can just make that a priority weekly um, to let all the council members and everyone know sort of where we are that week going into vaccinations. Um, and I'll just also, and I'll get to you, Alderman Braithwaite and Alderman Fisk. Um, remember, if you're out there and you have a question or even for the council members, if you send an email to vaccine or vaccines, you could put the S there or not the S there, at cityofevanston.org, we have a team of folks responding to emails. Um, and they've been great. I've used them for a lot of questions that we're getting from, I'm getting from residents. So that's, uh, that's a tool as well. Alderman Braithwaite. Uh, just a quick question, Mayor. Are we keeping track of demographics as we're vaccinating by age, race, gender? If if they put that information into the um, the contact form uh, that was completed, they have that they have that information. Yes. Oh, and the they being the health department just health. to get a quote. the health the health department does. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Alderman uh, Fisk. Um, yeah, Mr. Mayor. Um, so you mentioned that. Um, the Pfizer is being given at Amita because of why? Why? Oh, because it's a it's a more um, complex vaccine because of the storage requirements of it. 
Um, and so I think we've done it at the city facilities, uh, but it's just a little easier if we have uh, a partner like Amita St. Francis do it because they have all the, the proper refrigeration and everything. Okay, I, I just wanted to make sure that we didn't raise the question in people's minds about which was the safer, the safer vaccine to get. Yeah, so that, uh, I, I'm glad you brought that up. point up. Again, Dr. Fauci and other experts have been very, very clear. Uh, whichever vaccine you can get, you should get. Uh, they're all deemed as very sort of high level of confidence and reliability on these right. vaccines. Alderman Rainey. I think um, that vaccine has to do with administration of it because it has to do with the five or six doses and the um, piece of equipment that puts it in your arm. That's that's really the big issue with that vaccine. Mm. It, it infuses yeah. more, more <clears throat> vaccine into your arm, doesn't leave it in the syringe. And so there was this confusion as to whether the vial provides for five doses or six doses and mm. That's that's part of the complication with the Pfizer vaccine. And so they they want hospitals to use the the um, syringe as oh. opposed to you know volunteers like us. <laughs> yep. All right. So that that wraps up then a quick update on uh, COVID and vac vaccinations. Um, I'm now going to turn it over to our city manager for any announcements she has. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just have one announcement. I just wanted to give a big thank you to the residents and to our city staff for the cooperative effort uh, that it took to handle the snow event that we had last week. Uh, multiple days upon multiple days of snow preceding uh, a very large snow event. It's always challenging and we had a lot of moments where teams came together and residents came together and I really appreciate all the efforts. Uh, it's not just our snowplow drivers who we need to extend our extreme gratitude to, it's also our fleet staff, our facility staff, our 301, our parking enforcement. It's really a, a team effort when it comes to uh, trying to get all of uh, that snow cleared and get the roadways passable and get the sidewalks cleared and we're still uh, recovering from it. We're still cleaning up and melting a lot of the snow, but we're in much better shape. And I just wanted to say thank you to all uh, who helped. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. All right, thank, thank you, City Manager Storley. Uh, City Clerk, I think we have some, some a big event yeah, coming up. We just, we, yeah, well, it, uh, Evanstonians don't seem to think it's as big as it is. Uh, and so I'm gonna go over a little bit of uh, what's been going on, please. Uh, so election day is, of course, uh, tomorrow, or the primary election is tomorrow. Uh, uh, the candidates, I'm sorry, my dog is drinking water in the background. Uh, the candidates for uh, mayor, uh, clerk, uh, fourth ward alderman, and eighth ward alderman will be on uh, the ballot. Um, thus far, uh, as of today, or t today was the last day for early voting, and so we ended up with... Uh, just under 2,000 uh, folks early voting. Um, typically early voting comprises from what I've uh, uh, researched uh, about 25 to 30% of total turnout. So it seems like turnout may end up to be uh, around somewhere around 8,000, seven to 8,000. Uh, so not uh, one of our best showings. So I encourage you to, again, encourage your neighbors to get out and vote. Uh, polling places can be found uh, on uh, the Cook County Clerk's website. Um, we've had uh, 4,500 folks request mail-in ballots, uh, just under 4,500 folks request mail-in ballots. And as of uh, just a bit ago, uh, only 1,700, just over 1,700 of those folks have turned in uh, the mail-in ballots. So we're under 50% uh, return rate thus far. Uh, so. Uh, get your mail-in ballots in tomorrow. Uh, text neighbors, uh, text friends, uh, reach out to folks and let them know uh, to, to return their ballots uh, so we can increase turnout. Uh, I can take any questions. Uh, drop boxes are available at Skokie Courthouse. Uh, so if you, we, we didn't have a drop box available uh, in Evanston uh, uh, this time around. Uh, because the, the drop box, the, the law that allowed for drop boxes was a temporary uh, 
uh, allowance and it wasn't renewed uh, in time enough for this election. Uh, so folks can do a drop box for your mail-in ballots at Skokie. Or if you have a mail-in ballot, you can surrender it uh, at uh, your polling place tomorrow and vote on election day. Or if you have not received your mail-in ballot for any reason, you certainly still can go and vote. You'll receive a provisional ballot, um, which just means that your ballot will be counted a few days later after we uh, the county has confirmed that your mail-in ballot isn't received. That's uh, uh, just based on the elections. Oh, go ahead. A couple of quick questions, Clerk. First of all, can you duplicate the information that's on the clerk on the Cook County Clerk's page for where Evanston voters should race should uh, go to vote? Yes. Uh, are you, when you say duplicate, I've I've so if we go to City of Evanston right now to oh you want it on the city's you, web page okay. Save saves our residents one click. Yeah, and I don't then, have uh, maybe uh, Erica uh, Kimberly. I don't have access to edit the website, but if uh, I can send you the link in an email, and if you can just add it there, or, or Mr. Gomez, if you're here. Okay. And then my okay. second question, in terms of the mail-in ballot, you gave a lot of information. I just got it confused. So if somebody has a mail-in ballot, they can mm -hmm. either bring it to where we vote, is that what you shared? Or can you just uh, put the damn thing in the mail? I'm... Uh, well, yeah, you can put it in the mail. You can certainly just put it in the mail. But if, okay. you know, if you, for some reason, have changed your mind about uh, casting a mail-in ballot, you can surrender it and vote on election day um, okay. at your local polling place. Okay, that's what you said. And then in terms of the reason why the box isn't there, what was the hang up there just so it doesn't we have what another four years or two years to figure that one out what's going on there yeah the, the drop box is just it was uh, available for november uh because of an emergency uh because of covid an emergency order that allowed it uh and that's no longer valid for this election got it okay yeah. thank you for the clarification oh and, and let me clarify also uh yesterday I'm, i might have misspoken so uh, today may have been the last day to use the Skokie Dropbox. Uh, you know, you can reach out to the office tomorrow to confirm that. I, I think it is the last day at Skokie was today. It's usually the yeah, last day. Yeah. Wait, can you just say publicly, I know Peter, uh, Autumn and Braithway asked this, but every polling place is open tomorrow. Is that correct? Uh, yes. some, uh, some people don't have uh, in the primary, you know, in your, in your yes. Okay. Yes, because uh, mayor's race and clerk's race uh, is on, 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 on every ballot. And if people find that they, there is an issue, I know I think last time there were some issues with not having enough election judges, which I know we don't handle. Who yeah. should they call? Should they call 311? I would, uh, well, if, if, they're on a, if you're having long lines, I, I don't suspect that we'll have that problem. Turnout is not. Uh, well, not long lines. I thought last time there was an issue with not having enough polling judges or Co workers. Oh, yeah, that I think that uh, we had a few places that opened late because of uh, it, this is during the, I think that was in the primary election uh, when COVID uh, first uh, uh, before we went into the lockdown. Okay. I guess I'm saying that I, I think everything will run smoothly tomorrow. It, but you can reach out to the county. Uh, if there are any issues, you can reach out to the county clerk's office. Um, Google Cook County Clerk or to the city clerk's office and we can help make the connection. All right. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Clerk Reed, for that, that update on the election. So uh, please, if you haven't voted, go out and vote in the local elections uh, tomorrow. Um, we're now going to turn to public comment. Uh, we have 10 people that have signed up for public comment. So per our rules, uh, everyone can have three minutes for public comment. Um, I will keep track of the time. So if you hear the buzzer go off, please uh, stop talking or wrap up really quickly. Uh, and we'll get through this in our allotted time. Uh, so tonight, our first speaker is going to be Toby Sachs, then Robbie Marcus, and then Ray. Fr so welcome, Toby. Thank you, Matt Hackerty. Uh, I'm Toby Sachs. I serve as the chair of Evanston Arts Council. And you have an update on equity on your agenda today. So I just wanted to share our experience on the Arts Council of bringing a more focused equity lens to our work 
and specifically to thank staff for helping us on our journey. 18 months ago, we formed an equity working group of the Arts Council. We attended anti-racism training specifically for arts organisers, and we've met monthly since then. The input of the working group is what led to a wholesale reimagining of the annual grants programme, reflecting both the impact of the pandemic and our heightened focus on racial equity. We specified the grant judging panel would be mostly black, indigenous or people of colour. And most importantly, we specified that organisations and programmes serving BIPOC and underserved demographics and communities would be favoured in our grant allocations. As a result, the number of applications went up over 65%. 60% of those had never applied to us before. 71% of the grants that we gave out went to BIPOC organisations or projects primarily serving BIPOC or underserved populations. That's 15 out of 21 grants versus three out of 12 the prior year. Of course, we're continuing those guidelines this year, and we're also launching a coaching program to mentor less experienced grant writers through the process. I just wanted to thank Kimberly Richardson for mentoring the working group and really getting us as far as we've come so far on the journey, uh, and to take the opportunity to demonstrate that making a real focus on equity can start to bring some measurable change in the work of our boards and commissions. Thank you for the time. Right, thank you, Toby. And thank you for all your work on the Arts Council. Uh, how about we get Robbie Marcus next, and then Ray Friedman, then Meg Walsh. Hi there, can you all hear me? We can, welcome Robbie. Good evening, thanks. Uh, yeah, I'll be brief because I think my understanding is that Planning and Development Committee actually took the Efficiency Homes item off the City Council agenda tonight. So I fully support the Efficiency Homes, though if it's not on the Council agenda, uh, I have no public comment this evening. Bobby, just so you know, I think I think what happened is it was removed for introduction and action. I still think it's on our agenda tonight for introduction. For discussion? For, it's It would be for discussion if people want to discuss it too, uh, but it's not going to be introduction and action at the same okay. meeting. So okay. if you want if you want to make comments, you're welcome to do that. Sure, sure, yeah. Um, that, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think, you know, based on the research included in the, the packet provided by the applicant for the policy, it seems that there are dozens of uh, vacant, small or irregular uh, properties which currently sit empty um, simply because of our zoning rules. And so given the scarcity of land in Evanston, um, I think our cooperative was excited to see uh, missing middle housing solutions is the, the term that's often used that activate these small uh, lots um, as a as a way to address um, the cost of housing. It's uh, it's likely that uh, you know the small houses constructed on these lots would be priced below market based on their relative size, and additionally, based on the map, it seems that they would be scattered all across the Evanston community. Um, I, I think it's fair to say that this would not solve Evanston's housing challenges overnight, though. By allowing for a new housing type across our city, I, I think it is one tangible step towards shifting Evanston away from uh, these exclusionary zoning policies that have historically segregated uh, by class and by race. Um, so thank you very much and I look forward to uh, seeing where this goes. Great. Thank, thank you, Robbie. Uh, next up, we've got Ray Freeman, then Meg Welsh, then Priscilla Giles. Good evening, everyone. Uh, this is Ray Friedman, second ward. Can you hear me okay? We can. Welcome, Ray. All right, thank you. Um, I'm not going to talk about uh, having conversation with everybody or dialogue tonight. Change subjects for change. Um, first, I want to say that in the past five years I've lived here, uh, I've been impressed with the way Evanston keeps its trees trimmed, sod replaced, street lights are brighter, and cleaning the leaves is amazing to me that there's trucks and trucks filled with leaves going up and down in fall. Um, I heard what you said, Mayor, about cleaning the snow and uh, Erica Storley about cleaning the snow. I appreciate the snow removal, but there's a huge issue here. Um, I, I'm just, I'm baffled and disappointed by the disorganization and lack of planning in your snow plowing, which plowed uh, alleys. It plowed cars in. Uh, they came by both sides of the street same day. So cars were, sides of cars were covered 
Um, so I know there's a lot of snow, and I I I'm lend my hand to to anybody who needs it with uh, my snow blower or shovel. Um, so, but I, we've heard from residents in the past about plowing corner sidewalks, about throwing people, putting plowing the snow in people's driveways, um, and I'm seeing. The alleys, both sides of my alley, were plowed in at one point, okay? <laughs> Never anybody had, no truck had gone through my alley still. I don't think a truck has gone through my alley. I was stuck in my alley last week for two hours. Uh, I think I blew out the transmission. Um, so this is this is not a good situation for, I don't know how it is in, in other wards, but here, second ward, I, I would assume that it's probably the same in the fifth ward. If you go down uh, Pittner from Dempster, um, you can't fit a truck uh, down the middle of the street if cars are parked on both sides of the street. I barely had enough room to fit my van down the street. So this is, it's not good. It's just not showing consideration for residents. And other suburbs, I know clean their alleys and cl I know Skokie cleans their alleys and cleans their sidewalks. And I don't see any reason why the city of Evanston can't do the same. Uh, plenty of people have asked, clean the alleys, clean at the, still. I mean, you can't get that. Yesterday I helped somebody uh, push their van out of my alley. Um, that's, that's crazy. The snow stopped a week ago. So um, we need to figure out how to put that, uh, you know, into the agenda to have the alleys clean and have our sidewalks cleaned. That would save a whole lot of trouble for everybody. Um, anyhow, I hope the new city council will be able to do a better job with this uh, snow removal. And thank you for all your time and uh, have a good night. Thank, thank you, Ray. All right, next up, we've got Meg Welsh, then Priscilla Giles, then Bonnie Wilson. Hey, um, today I received an email from Mayor Steve Haggerty recommending candidates that he wants me to vote for in the city, mayor, alderman, and clerk office races. Uh, this email did not give a courtesy mention even to all the candidates for every office. The email did not come from his official Evanston email public account to which I subscribed after he took office. It came from a private email account. I subscribed to the mayor of Evanston's official email list to receive his news and perspective as mayor on Evanston official business. It seems clear that the mayor used the subscriber to this official city list to promote his preferred candidates. He did not use his city email account to send them an email but the recipients appear to have been obtained from his official email account. If I'm mistaken, I'm open to correction. I have never followed him as a political figure, nor subscribed to any political email account of the mayor's. I did not subscribe my email to his mayoral campaign. Other, Ev Re other Evanston residents have similar news to report. This is not equivalent to a Jan's Pitts sent to registered Dems in the Ninth Ward. This is not illegal, but it is unethical. How is it unethical? It's the type of using the resources and advantages of public office to advance an elected official's personal will or to benefit their cronies, which ethics guidelines are designed to guard against. The mayor is entitled to have an opinion. It's inappropriate to use resources gained through his political office to advance his private political will. It is also the type of practice that results in incumbents being reelected over and over as elected officials use the contacts and relationships gained through conducting official business. Who else has an email list with probably tens of thousands of Evanston residents? Weren't the email recipients more likely to open and read the email expecting the city news from the mayor that they signed up for? Many evidence re Evanston residents object to actions like this by the mayor and by some council members which avoid technical illegality while failing to avoid even the appearance of impropriety standard 
which used to be a clause in our ethics ordinance. I hope it still is. I know it's been rewritten. I hope the future mayor of Evanston will not continue this practice. And I hope Evanston voters will consider this as they make their voting selections. Um, mayor Steve Haggerty, please unsubscribe me from Steve at stevehaggerty.com. I did not sign up for your email list. Thank you, thank you, uh, Meg Welsh. Next up, we've got Priscilla Giles, Bonnie Wilson, and Rick Schweitzer. Thank you. Um, I'd like to say that I've lived long enough to see snow being removed from the alley again, even though there were some problems with it. But I think, I know there are more houses in Evanston um, so that the sidewalks and the alleys, the streets all can be um, shoveled just as they were when uh, Alderman Fleming was in heaven waiting to be born. So I'd also like to say the um, streets of Emerson and Jackson are about to be destroyed by a private um, owner and developers, which will change the community, which has been home to longtime Evanston residents and low income residents for many years. This is not the desire of the black and brown community, even though the people who um, are, who say housing for low income um, residents is a priority for Evanston. It's not so. The beautiful lawn at Mayor Morton's City Hall, soon to not be Mayor Morton, and the buildings, uh, the building itself seems slated for the same destruction and replacement by developers' desire, mandated by unnamed uh, powers that be. Residents seem to have no voice in the, in, in the uh, choice of what happens to their greenery, to happen to the or to the city. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Giles. Uh, next up, we've got Bonnie Wilson, then Rick Schweitzer, then Carla Sutt. Hi, everybody. I'm Bonnie Wilson, and I live in the First Ward, and I've been a real estate agent for 35 years in Evanston. I like to speak in support of the efficient, Efficiency Homes Ordinance, item P P4. I believe that Evanston needs to open our zoning code, co code up for diverse missing middle housing types that address the mismatch between Evanston's available housing stock. Based on their size and relative price on the market, efficiency homes can advance our city council's goal to expand affordable housing options. In this case, by creating smaller units for downsizing seniors or young couples looking for a starter home. Additionally, by serving moderate income seniors, efficiency homes could make could help make Evanston an age-friendly city that provides an array of healthy, accessible options to our older residents. I also want to mention, mention that I went on the multiple listing service today and found only one house for sale between 250 to 300. So obviously you're talking about homes in that price, the small homes in that price range, there's only one home on the market. So hopefully there will be more when efficiency homes are, are able to be built in Evanston. There are 65 condos available right now in Evanston, but those have uh, assessments and cost more money to, for, um, for costs every, every month. I also want to mention that maybe we should contact Fritz Kage, our Cook County Assessor, and tell him about these efficiency homes that we're planning to put to, or planning to build in Evanston so he would get a heads up regarding assessments and how they would assess these homes. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Bonnie. Uh, next up, we've got uh, Rick Schweitzer, then Carla Sutton, then Matt Rogers. <clears throat> Good evening, council members. I'm here to encourage you to discuss the appeal of the Historic Preservation Commission denial of our application for economic hardship with respect to the barn, historic barn, accessory dwelling unit at 2404 Ridge. There's only one standard that's to be considered in this case. That is by refusing to grant a COA, Certificate of Appropriateness, on the above property, we as property owners are denied all reasonable beneficial use or return on the barn property in question. There's no question that this is the case as Commissioner Cohen well noted during the HBC meeting. 
there does not exist in the standard any question about how or when the work at issue was performed, authorized or not. There is no part of the standard that talks about whether the work performed 20 plus years ago is authorized due to a legitimate time bar running, only whether denial of the certificate of appropriateness denies us as owners reasonable beneficial use or return on the building in question. The city has continued to deny our request for a final occupancy permit based loosely on the fact that this very certificate of appropriateness has been denied for work done and approved by the city more than 20 years ago. The city needs more ADUs and this is a wonderful adaptive reuse of a derelict and historic building that has been saved from a sorry grave. Please discuss and consider overturning the heavy handed Historic Preservation Council denial of our COA based on our serious economic hardship if we continue to be denied legitimate rental use of this amazing 19th century barn. These are dire times and the hardship is very real. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Uh, next up, we've got Carla Sutton, Matt Rogers, and then Peter Mitchell. Do we have Carlos with us? I don't believe so, Mayor. All right, we'll see if he comes before we finish up. But how about Matt Rogers? Good evening, Mr. Mayor, uh, members of council and city staff. Uh, my name is Matt Rogers. I live at 133 Clyde Avenue. I am a zoning consultant and former chair of the Zoning Board of Appeals for the city. I come tonight in support of the change in the zoning ordinance to include a new definition and land use for efficiency homes or colloquially as they're referred to tiny homes. Uh, these have increased in popularity in many years. There's actually several TV shows that, that, that uh, feature these and it creates a, a permanent structure that is small and more efficient for people who prefer to have a, a smaller living space but still want something like a yard. Um, I heard the discussion during the P&D and many of the questions that were raised at that time and um, we're talking about very specific types of homes on very specific sites here. So this, this ordinance would create a new permitted use in all of our residential districts, R1 through R6, and would make use of substandard lots where housing currently cannot be built. Uh, by improving these lots, we offer um, the missing middle for homes, as well as increasing our tax base by improving lots um, that currently are sitting vacant. Uh, many of these are small home, are small properties, and it's a small number of properties that are privately owned and some are city owned. Uh, these properties have frontages of anywhere from maybe 20 to 25 feet, uh, size maybe of 2,800 to 3,500 square feet, um, and it does not include any of the properties with streets facing side yards, which has come before, before boards before and has, has met with some resistance. Um, what this does do is it allows for affordable housing, not in the strict definition of affordable housing, but attracting people who want a small home with a yard. Um, as was mentioned earlier, I did a little survey and there are currently only a handful of homes in, this, in the city of Evanston that are available for under 500,000. The majority of them go for over 800,000. Um, by creating a home that would have a, a selling price for somewhere in the upper 200s, low 300s, um, we not only are able to provide a home for people who are interested, but also to create a home that currently or that meets current code as well as providing the expected amenities one has. Um, I'm going to send an email to all the council members. I heard your discussion earlier and I'm available to answer questions for you, to discuss things with you um, on this particular issue. So I'm just making myself available. Uh, Mr. Gallimore asked me to uh, sort of help with this. And so I am available to take questions um, or engage in discussion with, with any of the members on council who may have a question. Thank you, thank, thank you, you, Matt. Thank you. All right, next up, we've got Peter Mitchell. Hey, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Peter Mitchell. I live in 1942 Orrington in Evanston. And I want to um, uh, recommend that this body listen to the appeal um, on the uh, 2404 Ridge. Um, I know this is coming from Rick Schweitzer, 
that's the man I know well who has worked diligently for the community, uh, for refugees, um, for um, uh, for his family over a long time. And it seems as if, um, well, I don't understand all the uh, nuts and, and bolts of this case. It seems like he's being denied um, the right to work with this property um, because of some time limit that was put on while he was a family man and, and doing all this great work. So I strongly urge this body go ahead and listen to the appeal and um, and take it from there. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. All right. And then do we have, did Carlos Sutton join us? Luke, I want to make sure I, I think I got everybody that was on the list you sent me. Is that right? There was one last minute um, addition, but I've not seen that person, I don't think. Gabriel. Do we have Gabriel with us? Doesn't okay. look like it. I don't see that either. Okay. Um, all right. So then that's going to conclude public comment. I want to thank everybody for coming forward and sharing their thoughts. Uh, suggestions or concerns with us. Um, for the record, uh, I know there was one uh, resident who was upset. Uh, I did not use any existing city lists for a mailing today or anything like that. Um, so, uh, all right, let's move on to um, special orders of business. We've got uh, several special orders of business. I'm gonna ask uh, our senior alderwoman Alderman Rainey, if you would move SP1. Uh, you're muted, Ann. Still muted. I know, I know. Oh, there you go. Okay. Um, all right, SP1, Mr. Mayor, is. I have to get back organized. SP1. Um, SB1 is uh, 2404 Ridge Avenue, application to appeal uh, the Preservation Commission's denial of a certificate of economic hardship. The City Council may make a motion to accept the application to appeal. If a motion is made and adopted, the City Council uh, shall affirm modify or reverse the decision of the Preservation Commission within um, 45 days. If no motion to uh, accept the application to appeal is made and adopted, the decision of the Commission shall stand. Um, if a motion to accept is made, staff recommends the City Council affirm the decision of the Preservation Commission. This is for action this evening. Is there a second? I, and then I'll, yeah. Is there a second? So let me, let me, uh, the, the reason probably there's silence here. Let's, um, the way that it was written by staff on SP1 was explaining what, what happens here. And so um, would, uh, I'm going to open and ask then. So thank you for, for sharing that. Um, so everybody understands Alderman Rainey. I'm going to ask if there's an alderman that would like to make a motion one way or the other, either to accept it or to deny it. Uh, and if they'd like to put that motion forward. Alderman Rainey. Um, could I do something else? <laughs> oh, let's hear. Yeah, sure. <laughs> put it out there. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering, and we have, every time we have one of these, we have this problem. Is there any reason why we can't have a discussion on the side regarding the pros and cons of whether or not to have a discussion as to why we shouldn't at least discuss the pros and cons of this case? without making a major, I mean, I, I, I've never understood why this is so complicated. 
Um, I assume it's that it's just a Robert's rules of orders that we need something moved and seconded in order to have a conversation. But you can't uh, have the conversation there unless you want to really consider going forward with this and and not you've got to either cut this off at the knees or not. And I, I just think it never gives us a chance to really get into the, the issue. Let's see, let's see what our city attorney, uh, her thoughts are on this. Good Kelly. evening, uh, Mayor, City Council, Clark Reed, um, City Manager Storley, Kelly Ganderski, Corporation Council. Um, it's in part the way that the code is written under Section 2-8-8. It really only leaves a few options, um, either to approve, deny, or if there is no motion made. And there is a provision in the code that if there is no motion made, procedurally, what can be done? So under Robert's rules, I think to have a discussion would only be appropriate if on the motion that's being made, if that makes sense. So you got to make somebody's got to make a motion either to accept it, deny it, it's seconded, and then we can have and then we can have a discussion if people want to have a discussion. There could also be a third option of no motion being made as well. Oh, okay. Oh, that's interesting. Can I clarify because to Autumn Rainey's point, what Kelly said. Even if you made a motion to say accept and someone seconds that, we still can't have a motion on the merit of the thing. We can only say, is that correct, Kelly? If there's a motion to accept, let's say, and then there's a second to that, there would be discussion on that motion to accept. Right, but not discussion on the content of the request. Well, um, I guess it could plays into part of why it would be why the motion to accept would be on the table. And I think there could be discussion around that. And maybe because I share, and I don't know if this is your concern, Alvin Rainey, but we've had this one several times. I think this has been in the queue for years. Um, and it's, you know, we, we don't ever have a chance to ha ask questions, I guess, unless we go to preservation committee. Um, so we can make a motion and send it back to preservation committee. And I guess I could go there to discuss, but you know, if I have questions for the staff, this is not an appropriate time to do that under the way that the rules are in front of us. I think preservation commission meets, I think usually when some other meeting is taking place and you read about it in your packet, but it, it just seems to me that we have blinders on and we don't, we don't handle any other issues like this. You know, we're not going to, we're not going to talk any, we're not going to discuss this. If something goes to the plan commission and, and we have concerns about it, we, we get it before us and we discuss it. But in, in the case of preservation, we say they made a decision. We either, we, we either accept it or deny it. We don't, we're not allowed to discuss it. And I, it just seems to me very off-putting uh, to deal with an issue like that. And I, I know I did get I did get four or five emails saying, "Do not, do not accept this. Do not accept this appeal." And they're from people I highly respect, but I would like to discuss it among my colleagues on the council, but. You know, I feel I'll be offending people if I do, and, and and I'd like to hear from my colleagues why it's so offensive to discuss this. Kelly, can the count? I mean, this is for action on SB one is for action. Can some can someone can the council <laughs> move it to just discussion? No, <laughs> well, I think I think there has to be a second to the motion and then there can be discussion um and then a vote would be taken i suppose all right so i'm going to ask if any aldermen want to move this uh sp1 2404 ridge application for appeal of the preservation commission denial of a certificate of economic hardship one way or the other i'd like to move for a discussion but apparently we can't. Think that's legitimate. Apparently we can't. So this is a move for action one way or the other. Why is if, this any different than us just making a motion, seconding it, having discussion, and then everybody voting? I'm, 
Just That's my question, Alderman Simmons. Is it, it's, it, it is different. It's not different. It's there has to be a second to a motion and then there can be discussion. That's under any item. I move um, to ex I move to accept the appeal on this matter. Second. Okay, so now it's open for discussion and then there'll be a vote on accepting the appeal. That's right. Okay, so is there any so, discussion? So my motion uh, to accept this appeal is for the purpose of finding out what people's feelings are about why we don't want to accept this appeal. There. Okay. All right, is there any, dis any discussion? Anybody want to engage with Alderman Rainey in her question? So I guess my... Um, Alderman Fleming. Oh, I'm sorry. Just started. Oh, sorry. Um, so, so I'm not, you know, I don't have personal stake to be opposed or, I mean, to, you know, accept or, or be opposed. I think I received the same emails as Alderman Rainey. Um, it just seems like this, and I don't have the entire packet from me because I just have notes, has been back and forth and back and forth. And I... You know, from what one of the emails talked about was that this gentleman, although it says, you know, economic hardship is not really claiming a hardship. Um, from what I remember reading in the very long packet, it's about the coach house, which he seemed to communicate was part of, you know, being able to obviously make money, keep the house and pay the taxes and all that, which seems like a legitimate concern. But then in reading what the Preservation Commission says, that does not fall with under his the claim of economic hardship. So it was a little bit confusing if I'm honest um, and you know aside from memorizing all the comments they had I guess I would love to hear a little bit more from staff in terms of why this has taken so long and why this does not fall under what one would consider by statement economic of statement certificate of economic hardship and you know if we understand people are having a hard time economically all over America why we would not you know work with this resident to get the property you know, up to par if he's claiming he can't do it all because of economic hardship. All right, jo Johanna uh, Nyden is with us. Uh, welcome, Johanna. Uh, good evening, uh, Johanna Nyden, Community Development Director, and I've, I'll ask Cade Sterling to join us um, as well. Attorney Kira Romney at the moment. Uh, he's been the staff liaison to the Preservation Commission and the de facto staff liaison on this particular project of late. Um, this project has a 20 year history. The property owner is not a resident. He owns the property uh, and has rented it over the years. Um, and as you know, uh, the coach house slash barn was only recently allowed to be legally rented um, as, a, as a dwelling unit. Um, we did not allow that until, until recently the code was changed. So um, this, there's a long history and I'm sure you've gotten emails from neighbors of the property um, concerned residents. Uh, this this particular instance has been um, of working through various issues that are enumerated in the, in the memo have been going on for a number of years um, of late the past, I think about two, three years at this point. Um, and in terms of economic hardship, uh, that, and Kate will speak a little bit more to this, that's really designed if the certificate of appropriateness or the, his, the nature of the preservation activities are taking away value from the property, but none of the, the denial of the certificate of appropriateness um, for the changes he wanted to make prevented him from leasing or selling or doing anything to the property. And I think Kate can probably also provide some examples of uh, a situation in which might a certificate of economic hardship might be appropriate um, for to be considered and, and accepted. Um, so Cade, uh, this is Cade Sterling. Some of you may have not and informally, he is one of the staff planners in the community development department. Hello, can you hear me okay? Yes. Perfect. Um, I, I think I'd like to just make the point that equating um, a financial burden and economic hardship is, is a dangerous precedent to state uh, to make. So what he's claiming is a, is a financial burden. An economic hardship specifically under this code section and related to preservation is when complete value and complete use of a property is taken away by a denial of a certificate of appropriateness. The, the best example I can, I can give is, let's say there's a two-part commercial building, two or three-story commercial building in downtown, and that's zoned for 14, 15 stories. Someone comes in, 
certificate of appropriateness to demolish the building and it's denied that could be seen as an economic hardship because the value of the property is substantially larger than what's existing on it. I don't know if that's if that's helpful or if that answers a specific question, but I think I think it's easy to um, easy to see how economic hardship and a financial burden are similar, but in this instance, they're they're very much different. That does that's it. Provide a lot of clarity. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It does. Yeah. Thank you, Kate. Any other questions or comments? Now, the motion that's been put forward is to um, accept this appeal um, that was put forward by Alderman Rainey, seconded by Al Alderman Fleming. I think. I have an expression, uh, Mr. Mayor, and that is um, you can count. <laughs> there doesn't seem to be any interest in discussing this. And I, it just seems that um, we usually have more interest in our issues that are before the council. And this seems like a very interesting issue. And I'm just very surprised at the lack of interest in this. I, I think this is a very interesting issue. I guess I was wrong again. Well, we will, I'm going to go ahead then and call uh, call the vote and ask the clerk to uh, take the vote. And again, uh, the vote that you're taking is to, uh, the motion was to accept the appeal uh, and it was seconded. And, and this is to the accept the appeal on 2404 Ridge Avenue, um, which received an application for appeal of the Preservation Commission denial of a certificate of economic hardship. City Clerk, could you take? And Mr. Mayor, the, so the the total denial is based on that one concept, which Cade really explained very well. Economic card. Yep. Yeah. So, City Clerk, could you take the roll, Sorry, please? Mr. Mayor, can you just be very clear because this is one of those tricky ones. So it says if a motion to accept is made, staff recommend we affirm the decision. So that would be a yes. But this is one of those tricky ones where it's you affirm or not affirm you. Is everyone else clear? I mean, I just sometimes I get confused on these because there are a lot of words here. It's either yes or no. <laughs> I'm like, well, I realize no, that. But, but no, it's really important. I'm really glad you raised that, Alderman. Yes, um, this one, Alderman Braithway. Yeah. So if we, if the council is, and correct me, uh, Kelly Gandersky, if the council is voting to accept, it means they are accepting the uh, decision of the Preservation Commission. No, no. Um, Alderman yeah. is right. So it's, if you're moving to accept, you're moving to accept the appeal. Right. And then you have 45 days to hear the appeal. Okay. So we should vote no if we are we are accepting uh, the preservation commission's decision. So the motion was to ex the motion was to accept the appeal. If the council chooses, if the council wants to hear the appeal, then then it would be a yes vote. If the council does yep. not want to take up the appeal, the vote is no. Okay, everybody clear on that? Yep. All right, City Clerk, take the roll, please. Alderman Rainey? No. Alderman Fleming? No. Alderman Fisk? No. Alderman Braithwaite? No. Alderman Wynn? No. Alderman Wilson? No. Alderman Ruth Simmons? No. Alderman Suffredin? No. Alderman Ravel? No. All right. So on a nine nine to zero vote, the Evanston City, or excuse me, well, a, a nine to zero vote, the city council uh, decided not to accept the uh, the appeal, um, meaning the rule, ruling of the Preservation Commission stands. Okay. We're going to move now to SP2. Um, Alderman Rainey, could you uh, just move that item? Yes, sir. SP2, um, the city of Evanston, let's see, hold on one second. Um, city of Evanston racial equity update. Staff recommends the city council accept and place on file the city's uh, racial equity report. This is for action. I move approval. Second. We must have a, a report here. 
All right, great. So this uh, item has been moved and seconded. Again, it's just going to accept and place on file uh, when we do a vote, but we've got a staff update for all of us. So I'm going to turn this over to our uh, city manager to start us off. Good evening. Um, this is Kimberly Sin, oh. Deputy City Manager. That's okay, Mayor. Um, good evening, Mayor, City Council, Clerk, and of course, um, City Manager Storley. Um, I want to provide a quick update on what has been happening around our racial equity with the city, um, operationalizing the work around racial equity. Um, can you, I just want to make sure you all can see my, my slides because I'm using dual screens. Great. Yes. Um, so this is going to be a quick overview of, uh, provide you a definition of what racial equity is in government. And this is just not for city staff, but also for the community. Um, as well as connecting to city council goals, how we're connecting equity to our city council goals and internal committee structures that have been set up to help with the implementation. Also tonight, I have our uh, chair, uh, Jane Grover of the, Econ excuse me, of the Equity and Empowerment Commission to provide just a quick update on what they're doing. Um, the Equity and Empowerment Commission does plan to come back to the council in April to provide some further um, guidance on their work. So racial equity in government, um, and I say in government because I recognize that racial equity has terms that um, many people have utilized, especially around social justice. And for government, racial equity is a process and an outcome. That is the definition that we utilize. Um, as government, we have to look at the policies and practices that drive outcomes and while we focus a lot on outcomes and talking about deliverables, um, which equals to race no longer determines one's social and economic outcomes, it's really the process that we as city um, staff are trying to implement because it is the process that's going to engage a more meaningful involved in citizenry in the creation of implementation of our institutional policies and practices that impact their lives. And when I say community, I also mean our internal community, which is our staff. Uh, so we also, so we're looking at it from both the external community as well as the internal community of the organization. But what I don't want to, to be bemused is that racial equity is not race exclusive. And I think that sometimes we do get into a debate and that happened recently in a meeting um, at our Equity and Empowerment Commission where the using of the word racial equity makes the assumption that it's only focusing on race. But what it really is trying to say is that if we focus on race, we're sitting around race, it improves outcomes for all individuals, regardless of race, ability, um, gender, and so forth. I want to quickly just provide a update of where racial equity sits on city council goals. So for the last few years, the city council has um, stated that ensuring equity in all city council goals is a separate goal. What I am asking us to look at is how do race, um, how do we look at racial equity as the process through which we implement city council goals? So even though we can keep it as a separate goal, what we need to start looking at and what I'm working with staff to develop is looking at how do we look at infrastructure, how do we look at community development, affordable housing, our long-term um, city finances, using a racial equity lens. And it's very important to look through the technical, which we've been doing, um, which staff has been doing very adequately at, but we also need to look at it from a racial standpoint, a racial equity standpoint, excuse me. It is important to do that work in order to really ensure that equity is embedded in all city operations. So real quickly, what we've done so far in our initiatives and training, this city council, this particular class of city council have done a lot. Uh, we've talked about the environmental justice re resolution, establishing um, a fund for local reparations, um, the commitment to end structural racism. And at, you know, at the time, you know, we were very one of a very, very small um, number of municipalities that did that. Now that has tripled, if not uh, fourfold of municipalities making these commitments. And of course, the creation of the Equity Empowerment Commission and Welcoming City Amendment, um, even though the, the original uh, Welcoming City Ordinance was done in 2016, the amendment that took place in 2017. 
And then continual training uh, with, with Beyond Diversity, with the Equity Institute through YWCA, and internally with the National Seed Project. What those are really focused on, and I transitioned to our equity impact assessment, is the top are really focused on the individual racism that we've experienced. And what I want us as an organization is really focused on the institutional. And so I look at an example of our um, language access guidelines. Staff who helped develop the guidelines also participated in our racial equity review of our social studies services and implemented a number of strategies using racial equity lens with our language access guidelines. In developing the guidelines, they went and communicated with the community. They had um, individual meetings with certain um, community members who English is not their, um, their first language, as well as with organizations. And they also spoke with internal staff who are bilingual, who are, in, who are also engaged with um, non-English speaking or non-verbal individuals to help develop a guideline. And how I look at guidelines is the same way I would like to look at a number of um, practices that we are beginning to implement. The tool is the guidelines, but if we do not, like think of your favorite dish that you can make. If you don't have the right recipe with the right ingredients and the right instructions, what happens to that favorite dish of yours? It may not turn out right. And what we're looking at with our guidelines and other practices, we need to make sure we have the right information, the right directions and the right guidance, and then most importantly, training to ensure that our staff understand how to allocate resources, how to utilize what we have internally to better support their efforts when it comes to communicating with the public. And so we provided, uh, we've secured funding to help support that and to build capacity. And with that funding this year, we are looking to um, continue the tr um, to start translating documents that we have that are currently English only and also looking at expanding on our over the phone and video interpretations, which we've received several requests and has been a huge factor in communication for our contact tracers during COVID-19. So we are looking at our guidelines and continue to improve upon them as we see, as staff begins to test and really train on these, um, these documents. So as I mentioned, we've focused a lot in the last several years on the individual level of racism, which is the internalized and interpersonal racism. And that's good. And that's the hearts and minds that you may have heard previously being stated. But we also need to talk about the systematic and that's the institutional. And so in order to do that, I have evolved over the last year and realized you need both. So we're taking a two layer approach to organizing and learning performance improvement. One is with the Racial Equity and Inclusion Committee, which is a cohort of 15 to 16 employees that make up the entirety of the entirety of our organization. So we have representatives from every department except for the library as they've been doing their own internal work. And the purpose of this committee is to build a capacity of staff to identify, analyze, and improve internal processes that are barriers to achieving racial equity goals that the city has declared as priorities. Now, as I stated earlier, racial equity as defined in government is an outcome and a process. And this is the process for which we want to achieve better outcomes. They're gonna be, they are being trained under the supervision of Dr. Um, Clayton Yang of UIC. She has been working, she worked with the staff previously on our social services review and we'll continue that work to help develop and build capacity with our city staff. The hope is after this year that they're able to take this work back into their departments and utilize it. But also we're gonna be doing pilot projects throughout the year as well. So it's a learning and doing environment where we pick projects and see if they, if they are successful. And if they're not successful or not successful, we wanna look at why and figure out how best to um, re reestablish those programs. So that committee is currently structured. It's their beginning to meet. They're now in their second month. Um, they are training at this point. Hopefully by May or June, they'll begin doing their pilot projects. 
And then we have our diversity inclusion committee. This committee is made up of staff who are just interested in creating a space for staff to discuss and plan cultural awareness activities, as well as helping develop training for our internal staff. I call this our celebration and hearts and minds committee. What I recognize is that you have to do hearts and minds, but we have to do both. It is just not expected that without at least acknowledging cultural awareness, are we able to change people's understanding of racial equity. So this committee is, is staffed with right now about eight to nine employees. Um, they all were individuals who you know, signed up and wanted to be engaged and involved. And they too will be going through some training themselves so that as we begin to do some implementation in, the, in our organization, they have a better understanding of the shared language. So again, I'm just, this is a brief update. And just so you know, this PowerPoint is on our website that anyone wants to look at. And just again, talk about what the committee goals are for 2021 for the Ready Committee. And then also what the goals are for the DNI Committee. This is something where it will take time to see results. I believe that you know government is said to be slow but deliberate but we want to be transparent and something that we've been doing on a constant basis since uh the the idea of this has come about is working with our equity and apartment commission it is very important to build capacity through partnerships um so we are in conversations with ywca on how to work of our diversity and inclusion committee as well with our equity and apartment commission to build a more robust um, training program around, like I say, cultural awareness. And that is something that um, will be tailored differently for our boards and commissions and city council members and somewhat different for our city staff, but we will figure out what that is and we'll bring that to city council once more definitive um, information is available. And then with GARE, GARE is uh, our Government Alliance on Race and Equity uh, that is a network and our staff who um, are engaged to participate. I have to tell you, a lot of these ideas came from GARE. Um, just cut, um, me having an opportunity of engaging with colleagues throughout the United States. Uh, these are the ones that told me who have started this work ahead of us, what's worked and what's not worked. And so taking their um, successes and failures helped me shape what we should be doing moving forward. Um, I added Bloomberg Philanthropies because we are part of what works cities and they too are looking at racial equity. Um, Northwestern University, we worked with Creo to Career, I mean, are definitely partners in this work with us. And of course, our Evanston Public Library. One group that I did not mention in here, and I apologize, is our uh, Evanston Foundation. We have been communicating with them as well of seeing how best we can partner in some areas. And so it is so important that when doing this work that we're not just, you know, insular to only the city. We do recognize we have to be able to work with all of our partners throughout Evanston. And this is the way of building those blocks and doing so. Um, so I'm going to turn over real quickly to um, Jane to give a quick update on where they're at with the um, Equity and Empowerment Commission. And lastly, before I do that, I just want you to be aware it's intentional tonight that Jane is on this um, PowerPoint with me, this presentation, because I want all of our work to be more aligned and working with the boards and commissions, um, Equity and Empowerment Commission over the last few months, we recognize that's the only way for us to get this work done in a way that the community uh, feel heard and feel engaged is that we have to do this together. So I have today, um, Jane, if you would like to come online to, uh, Tell us what the Equity Apartment Commission is, is up to. Great. Thanks, uh, Interim Assistant City Manager Richardson. Um, first, uh, thanks to you and to uh, ICMA Fellow Shanika Hohenkirk for your work to support the Equity Empowerment Commission, and I will be brief. Uh, the commission was created with a rather broad purpose to identify and eradicate inequities. Next slide, please. I don't even know who's advancing the slides. Thank you. The first slide, back one. Thank you. So it's a rather broad purpose, which means we've got a lot to do. Clearly, I think beyond the capacity of a volunteer commission that meets for 90 minutes every month. Uh, this requires, as uh, interim assistant city manager Richardson has outlined, a plan, structures, and processes, staff, and your continued investment. 
So the commission um, has had a lot on its agenda as we work to understand our lane, as, as you will, in the city's racial equity initiatives and where we can be most effective. Most significantly, we considered and supported the resolution for a commitment to end structural racism and achieve racial equity. We supported the public engagement initiatives for the reparations ordinance and collaborated with Environmental Justice Evanston and the Environment Board on the environmental justice resolution. Thank you for that. And we're glad to report, I'm glad to report that the commission will soon have new leadership. Alejandra Benez, our next uh, chair, and Carla Thomas, who joined the commission last year, will be our vice chair. Uh, next slide, please. Our mission statement um, is the Equity Empowerment Commission's mission is to develop shared recognition and language of the history and impact of structural racism in Evanston and develop tools and practices to achieve racial equity for all residents. Uh, we worked through and, and came to this as a mission statement just in the last couple of meetings, just this year, I would say. Um, and what this means for 2021 and 2022 is that the commission will be collaborating with the city to support its racial equity training for city staff as, as interim assistant city manager Richardson has just outlined and for city staff and leadership. And we look forward to the adoption, we hope, of a racial equity impact analysis, an REIA decision-making tool across city departments to anticipate, assess, and prevent adverse consequences of structural racism and identify ways to remedy longstanding inequities. Um, the commission will also be supporting meaningful community engagement that gives voice to residents who have been historically disenfranchised and left out of decision-making processes, but who are directly affected by decisions, policies, and practices. And so this and, and the city's internal equity initiatives uh, depend upon a commitment of leadership and funding to support. So thank you and thank you in advance. And so the next slide, please. Our project for um, the, the commission for this next year, 18 months, we think, We'll be focusing our board on our boards, commissions, and task forces. As you know, we have over 40 of these volunteer committees working for the city, providing their expertise and time with varied purposes and powers. The decisions and recommendations of these boards and committees have had an impact on the city's policies, programs, budgets, and planning processes. And the community members who serve on the boards and committees bring their individual experiences and talents to the committee work we're grateful for their extraordinary sharing of time and expertise. It's the boards and committees and task forces that have also frequently been the city's leadership pipeline, as many of our elected officials spent years in this volunteer service. And they bring varied backgrounds and experiences in diversity, equity, and inclusion. That is, not everyone who serves on our boards and commissions is at the same place. So given the importance of these boards and commissions and their role in recommending policies, funding allocations and legislations, the commission has an opportunity to include these important community volunteers in the city's equity initiatives. So we have begun engaging our boards, commissions and committees in the equity discussion uh, with a survey to chairs and members about to determine how each brings equity to its agenda and work. And as you heard in the public comment by Toby Sachs, um, Chair of the Arts Council, operation, operationalizing equity through a committee's agenda requires common awareness, language, and purpose. And we hope this will complement and support interim assistant city manager Richardson's internal initiatives as well. Um, this project won't identify and eradicate inequities, um, uh, which was her initial purpose, but we intend for this work with the board's commissions and committees to be a meaningful part of this continuing process. The commission looks forward to talking with you in April uh, with our new leadership. And thank you to Alejandra Benez and Carla Thomas for taking on this role and to the other members of the commission, um, Alderman Melissa Wynn, Alderman Dolores Holmes, Kathy Lyons, Kimberly Walton, and Max Weinberg for sharing their expertise and time to serve on the Equity Empowerment Commission. With that, is there any questions for, for myself or for uh, Commissioner Grover? Can we put the whole screen up and then I can see everybody uh, if we take the presentation down? There we go. There we go. Th thank you, Kimberly, and thank you, Jane, for all of the work and the presentation tonight on this. Um, I'll just uh, start off by saying, because I know it's on a lot of people's minds, 
um, that I have been spending along with our staff, Kimberly Richardson and, and Erica Storley, uh, time with Dave Davis and others at Northwestern University uh, on the um, million dollar racial equity fund that they created for us. Um, or the million dollars, but it's to be geared towards racial equity. And um, that's gonna be released next week uh, publicly. Um, we'll put that out or, around March 1st, March I think March 2nd next week. Uh, we're just work, working on that, um, but that'll be uh, funding to do um, lots of important projects, um, some of which Kimberly mentioned, uh, there'll be some funding uh, for that. So anyway, I just want to give a heads up because I know that's on people's minds. Uh, Alderman Wynn, then Alderman uh, Fleming. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, and thank you also uh, to Chair Grover and thank you especially to Interim City Manager, Deputy City Manager Kimberly Richardson. Uh, as uh, the aldermanic liaison <clears throat> or, or aldermanic member of the Equity and Empowerment Commission, I know how much work um, the commission has put in, and I particularly know how much work Ms. Richardson has done. Uh, I, this is, as, as she was saying, and as uh, Ms. Grover was saying, uh, it's complex, uh, it's time consuming, and it's necessary, and, uh, it's, and it has to be pre comprehensive. And so uh, making sure that all city staff are trained and uh, in, in all aspects of equity is going to be, it's, go, it's a big task, but it, we really have to do it. We have to do it. And um, making sure also that every citizen volunteer who serves on our boards and commissions, which as we all just saw earlier, and we're gonna see on this agenda, um, they have uh, enormous power in the community to allocate funds, change our zoning. So it's critically important because they are participants in the formation of government policy that they also be equity trained. So I view this as a really exciting time, but it is critical that we have the appropriate funding and that we have the political will uh, for um, every member of the staff and all members of the city council to, to undertake this type of training. Uh, because it really will change and inform all of our decisions going forward. Here, here. Uh, Alderwoman Fleming. Uh, thank you. Um, so I have two questions, Kim. One, I just will, you know, thank you for the presentation. I think we're just going to have to, you and I disagree on the hearts and minds piece. I think that is not our place as government. We don't hire people based on what they think. But I do think we do need to get people to understand and respect cultural and racial differences, I, I will agree there, um, and that they need to understand that that is um, an important piece of what we're doing at the city of Evanston and, you know, how we're looking at them as employees. One thing I, I think I want to clarify, I think, and we might disagree on this one too, but your slide about, I took a picture just so I know, um, racial equity is not racial, is not race exclusive. I think, in my opinion, it would be better if we frame that as the results of racial equity are not race inclusive. So you know, centering race, which is why it's called racial equity is important because we know historically African-Americans and people of color have been at the bottom rung of just about everything. So we center race to improve life or outcomes or whatever you want to call it for those folks. And that also, you know, improves everything for everyone else. So kind of similar to the um, analogy people use about accessible, um, you know, curb cuts and, and sidewalks that are accessible for wheelchairs. When you do that for the wheelchair, for someone who needs an accessible um, sidewalk, it, it really doesn't hurt someone like me who, who doesn't need that, but it helps everybody. Whether you have a stroller or you're just running, having a curb cut helps everybody. So I think it's important, in my opinion, that we do center race, but we also communicate to people that we're centering race for these historic harms, but they also then do help everyone else. So we don't get into this kind of um, conversation around if we center race, then how is that going to hurt me? which I think is where a lot of people sometimes get confused in the racial equity conversation. If, if they're not a person of color, then it, you know, this work is going to hurt them instead of us communicating that it's going to actually help everybody. Um, and then my last thing that I forgot, now I had a lot of questions earlier. One last thing that I forgot in reviewing the plan with um, University of Chicago is it mentioned homework. And just want to be mindful if, if there is homework, I don't know how much homework there might be but the, we're either compensating people for work at home or we're allowing them to do that, you know, during the day. And I'm sure you've already thought about that, but I know our staff 
particularly around with the COVID have worked a lot and people are working in general a lot working from home. So just want to be mindful if they're part of a city committee and we're asking them to do extra work that that is something that they're either compensated for or they can do while they're on the clock somehow. So thank you for those um, reports. Thank, thank you. Um, Alderwoman Ruth Simmons. Thank you. Uh, Kimberly, I just want to thank you for um, the hard work that you have put into this and the commission. Um, I think I sent a note more than a year ago to the commission that I believe you have uh, probably the most challenging task ahead of you out of all of the commissions I'm doing work. And the more that we work on uh, reparations as a reparation committee, um, the more work is uncovered. So it's just endless. The target is always moving. Um, there are there's so much need and opportunity for improvement. It just never seems as though it's enough. So um, I just want to just offer you some encouragement and some appreciation, Kimberly, for the way that I have seen you um, innovate and think about new ways and seek out best practices that have worked well in other places and figure out how we can retrofit it here. Um, just thank you for working hard and uh, making yourself available to the community. I know the community has weighed um, in and I wanna thank the community for pushing. Um, it, it often is uncomfortable and um, you know, nobody's doing it right enough and everybody's right, you know, because it's so much need. Um, but I wanna thank the community and how um, the community's voice has pushed us to um, push ourselves and our staff and our networks to um, to serve the residents of Evanston um, better and more fully. So thank you, Kimberly, and thank you to the um, entire commission for all of your work uh, on racial equity. Thank you, Alderwoman. Any other comments or questions for Kimberly or Jane? All right, See, seeing none, uh, I'm gonna ask the clerk to take the roll. This is on SP2, which was for act, it was moved and seconded, it's for action, it's to accept and place on file the uh, city's racial equity update. Alderman Rainey. Alderman Rainey. You're muted. Oh, okay, I can see you now, hi. Um, Alderman Fleming. Aye. Alderman Fisk. Aye. Alderman Braithwaite. Aye. Alderman Nguyen. Aye. Alderman Wilson. Aye. Alderman Ruth Simmons. Aye. Alderman Sufferden. Aye. And Alderman Ravel. Aye. All right, so on a nine to zero vote, uh, the city's racial equity update is placed uh, on, is accepted and placed on file. Alderman Rainey, could you please move SP3? Yes, Mr. Mayor, SP3 is Climate Action and Resilience Plan CARP Implementation Update. Our staff is recommending uh, we accept and place on file this update on the implementation and climate action and resilience plan. Um, it's for action and acceptance. Um, I'm certain we have a report. I move approval. Second. Okay, all right, so this has been moved and seconded. And uh, yes, we do have a report and an update today, and that's gonna be from Kumar Jensen, our Chief Sustainability and Resilience Officer. It's nice to see you, Kumar. Uh, likewise, I see um, Manager Sterling is on. Did, did you wanna make a comment before I jump into my presentation? I was just gonna compliment on you on your good work and hand it over to you. So go ahead, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I do have a presentation, uh, good evening. Um, looks like I need access to be able to um, share my screen, but uh, good evening, um, honorable mayor, members of the council, uh, manager Storley and clerk Reed, Kumar Jensen, uh, chief sustainability and resilience officer. And I'm here to give a short update on uh, CARP implementation um, and our priorities for 2021. So um, normally I would start this presentation off with a uh, update or a reminder of what our goals are in CARP. There's a lot of goals and a lot of actions. I'm going to um, assume that you can access the document and take a look at those goals when you would like. Uh, and so what I wanted to focus a little bit more on today is 
um, how we want to be uh, how we want to be approaching implementation, and so what we should be focusing on. So I want to immediately just build off of what uh, Kimberly Richardson um, discussed and just shared around racial equity. It's it's absolutely uh, imperative that we be centering and operationalizing racial equity in the implementation of CARP. In the beginning of that document, we do reference centering um, racial equity, and uh, we need to continue to do that. We also need to continue um, and to do a better job of prioritizing services that support low-income residents and vulnerable populations uh, as we think about what services and programs we're going to be implementing. And also considering what our residents' primary needs. We, we've, um, as a city, become more and more aware of those through COVID and the economic hardship that it has ensued. And our plan and our response and our implementation of this plan needs to build off of that um, and recognize what we've, what we've learned. And then we also, as a part of that, one thing that um, we talked about before is increasing service options for residents and businesses. So making sure they have good options um, as we're asking them to make uh, changes potentially. And then lastly, is preparing for the impacts of the climate crisis. And so I want to um, talk a little bit about things that we have accomplished. And so in the memo, there's a there's a robust list of, I think, 30 or so actions that have been taken um, by the city and, and community partners and uh, many organizations and individuals. And I'm just gonna highlight a few here um, uh, uh, from 2020 in particular. And so um, we've mentioned a couple of times the approval of the environmental justice resolution. Uh, we've also done a lot around our uh, energy programs. And so those have been really big accomplishments this year. Additionally, uh, we've been, uh, we were able to complete the waste transfer station air quality study. We were able to uh, create some new uh, programmatic revenue through some fee changes. And so those have all been really positives uh, that we've been able to take from um, a really troubling and, and challenging year in 2020. And so we are, we are doing, I think, a good job of implementation. Um, and so as we think about what we're doing in 2021, um, I wanted to highlight a few sort of ongoing priorities. These are priorities that uh, my office will continue to, to, to focus on and to move forward uh, into, into 2021 with our existing resources. Um, I, I included in the memo a little bit more um, detail around each of these, but I, I do think it's worth it just to highlight them um, and, and say we need to continue to address the resident concerns around the waste transfer station. Uh, we have this uh, two-year Partners for Places grant that focuses on um, um, evaluating the barriers to transitioning existing affordable housing units um, to being climate resilient and uh, lower, uh, low, low energy and, and net zero carbon emissions. And so we need to wrap that up. We also have this municipal operations zero emissions strategy, which is really just looking at um, the city's buildings and the city's fleet uh, and saying, how do we decarbonize? How do we reduce the emissions and eliminate the emissions from the city's operations um, by 20, uh, 2035? And then with the environmental justice resolution being approved, we now need to implement that, that resolution. And so uh, my office is gonna be leading uh, the development of a mapping tool uh, along with um, support from other city departments. Uh, that is one action, and then the Equity and Empowerment Commission will be supporting um, the development of a um, community engagement policy. And then lastly, we've talked about this a couple times at the end of last year and early this year, it's just launching programs that have already been approved. So the new aggregation program and our new community solar program, which both are on track to being launched later uh, this, this spring and summer. So that being said, um, these ongoing priorities are certainly important and necessary in achieving our CARP goals, but they aren't really sufficient if we're going to take a more comprehensive and holistic approach to CARP implementation. And so I'm going to shift now to talk about uh, two approaches that, that I'm recommending, that, our, um, that staff are recommending for uh, thinking about how to do more comprehensive and longer term implementation. And so the first approach is focusing uh, on one high priority area. And so um, we're calling for focusing on building decarbonization and workforce development and tying those two together. Um, and then secondarily, um, uh, the development of a, an implementation strategy. And so why, why build this, right? Why would we pick this as one high priority area? 
Um, when I initially created this slide, there was about 15 items, but uh, it's a little too too long to put on here. But I think that buildings are really, really important for a variety of reasons. They, they represent an investment in our future, in Evanston's future. Uh, retrofitting and investing in buildings generates a lot of local economic activity, and it creates jobs and supports ex existing jobs. We also know that um, utility expenses make up a significant portion of people's living expenses, and that can oftentimes be exacerbated for low-income residents um, or, and renters and homeowners. Um, we also sort of, if, if we think about some of the other places we could focus on, Evanston actually has a lot of control and authority over buildings um, and their construction and operations. And so it's an area where we could actually um, make some significant improvement. Whereas impact in regional transportation, for example, is a lot harder and something that we have a lot less control over. And then um, retrofitted buildings tend to be quieter. They tend to be safer and more comfortable. Um, they certainly produce lower emissions and they can also have lower utility bills. Um, and then lastly, and this is what I want to get into a little bit more, is buildings are also responsible for 80% of greenhouse gas emissions in Evanston. Um, and so if we look at uh, the other big buckets of um, where emissions are coming from, uh, we have waste at 2%, which is um, comparatively very, very small. And then we have transportation, which includes the fuel that's being purchased in Evanston, but also our transit systems at 17%. And then buildings, which are 80%. And that 80% is split almost equally between electricity and natural gas. And so by focusing on buildings, this is really um, the key to getting to making significant progress towards um, our 2050 goals uh, and our 2025 goals. Additionally, um, other dynamics that will continue to persist unless addressed are that 40% of households in Evanston are housing cost burden. That's 51% of renters and 30% of homeowners. Um, and if we if we look just you know more specifically at um, individual technologies, we've seen a huge boom in solar installations in Evanston in the past two years, which has been tremendous. Um, solar reduces people's utility bills; it reduces carbon pollution. Um, but really, those installations aren't happening on on uh, low income, aren't benefiting low income residents and they aren't happening on affordable housing. Um, that's partially because we don't have systems there to specifically support or require that to happen. And then lastly, um, in terms of thinking about sort of existing dynamics, and this isn't meant to be comprehensive, but just to illustrate a few of them, um, earlier in 2020, um, there was this national report put out on flood risk uh, in, in each state. Um, so it looked at the entire country and what it showed, if you look at the report in you know, the section for Illinois, is that Evanston has the third highest proportional risk of properties at risk for flooding at 28%. Um, and so we know that if we don't do something to address these risks now, um, this is gonna continue to be an issue moving forward. And so um, all of these and other reasons are, are, are our prior or reasons why we should be focusing on this building decarbonization and workforce development initiative. And so I broke it out into three hypothetical program areas. Um, one that focused on new buildings, which is really looking at our building and our energy codes, uh, doing things like requiring all electric buildings, tying that to workforce development as well and in, 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 in training programs. The second one, um, looking at existing building retrofits we started to have some experience with group buy programs. Um, and so we've been kicking around this idea internally among staff and looking at how other cities have done this to see if we could develop a group buy and retrofit programs for a variety of different um, home improvements. So thinking about um, making it easier for people to put solar on their home or, or have energy efficiency upgrades made or do flood prevention um, upgrades in their, in their homes and one of the things that is really interesting is that if you tie these group I programs to um, workforce development is you can actually have a pretty big impact on getting people um, trained in into industries and get certifications through these local hiring programs. Um, so there's some some interesting opportunities there. And then lastly is um, focusing on some of the largest buildings in Evanston and um, recognizing that they produce a disproportionate amount of um, greenhouse gas emissions. And so saying we need to uh, start having them report and track um, and meet certain standards for emissions reduction 
over time. And so that's the, that's the building decarbonization and workforce initiative. The second uh, approach um, that we're advocating and uh, bringing forward is uh, a comprehensive implementation strategy. And so as the climate crisis accelerates, our response needs to accelerate as well. And hopefully we can respond quicker than the crisis um, uh, accelerates. Because we know that if we continue to operate under our business as usual mindset, that's going to lead to costs and heightened vulnerability um, among the community. And so if we look at what we need to do from uh, the standpoint of developing uh, comprehensive, comprehensive implementation, it will require a strategy be developed. It will require reviewing staff resources and what we have available to implement the strategy. And it will also require funding um, for project and program implementation. And so I'm going to stop there. Um, be glad to answer questions related to the memo um, or the presentation. And I will um, stop sharing my screen so uh, we can all see each other. But um, thank you. Great. Thank you, Kumar, uh, for all of your all of your good work. Uh, there's a lot to be done in the climate. I was telling Erica today, you know, I feel like there's really two yeah, there's a lot of emergencies out there in the world right now you know the focus is certainly on um on the pandemic uh that, you know if we don't move more quickly on the environment this is going to be really bad i mean we already see it is we're lucky right now there is all this ice build up along lake michigan because it's protecting our shorefront um, if there was a big storm or things like that, you know, we wouldn't see the damage because that ice is protecting us. Um, so we have a lot of work to do. The next council, there's going to be a lot to do here. And um, and I think we just need to step more. Uh, in this past year has really been um, more focused. It's been naturally focused on the pandemic. So. All right, uh, Alderman Wilson. Um, just briefly, and, and thank you for the report. And I also appreciate um, you know, kind of the redirection into specific tangible things and also the uh, particular attention to the impact of the of buildings. Um, I'm glad to see us, you know, you, you know, pointing our, you know, our attention to that because it is such a significant proportion of the, um, of the impact. So thank you for that. Absolutely. <laughs> Any other comments, questions? Alderman Rainey and then all Alderman Ravel. I think uh, your report, Kumar, was extraordinary and the best you've ever given. Thank you. And I can't help thinking how um, uh, the pandemic is really an equalizer. It goes across all 50 states and the entire world, actually. But when you look at man-made disasters, which I am calling the Texas situation, and how they treated their infrastructure um, without without considering the environment, um, that is terrifying. And some of the things you addressed are things that actually have to do with that locally. Um, we have to recognize that we have a certain environment here. And if we don't deal with our, our infrastructure as it relates to that environment, we could also see certain disasters um, in our future, maybe not tomorrow, but it, it is possible. And I, I really consider the Texas um, tragedy a tragedy, and it, it is man-made. They, they had a choice to fix that infrastructure, and they chose not to. And um, I, I, I think that is just terrific. And I, we should all be praying for those poor people. Thank you. Uh, Ald Alderman Ravel, then Alderman Fisk. Um, well, thank you, Kumar, for a really wonderful report and for all the hard work for the last um, however, couple of years now working on our CARP implementation. Um, I, I really, several things I really appreciated. One was the big emphasis on equity and um, ensuring that we're making, you know, addressing the impacts that our most, most vulnerable uh, residents face. Um, I like in the many of the strategies um, and action steps um, involve workforce training um, opportunities, which I think can be also really, um, you know, a double win for us if we can um, both 
retrofit some homes and also train more people in the workforce to be able, local people to be able to do that work. Um, I have uh, one question and then one, I don't know what I'm going to call it. Uh, so a question is, we've, we've been collecting benchmarking data from our larger buildings in Evanston. And so is that going to be useful? Are we going to, because you mentioned focusing on some of the larger buildings and, and do we have benchmarking data to go to these buildings and owners and say, here, look at, you know, here, here's some ways you could improve your performance. Yes, we absolutely do. And so um, we have, I think now four years of data for our largest buildings uh, for, or yes, I think it's four years um, of data for our largest buildings. And so um, that data has actually informed our approach of looking at the largest buildings and, and trying to determine what strategies might be most effective. We really think it's a combination of approaches. One would be some type of requirement, but then also providing them with a suite of tools. So whether that's tech, that, that would include technical assistance, um, also access to financing um, through uh, some state and local programs, um, and then some some coaching as well. And so not just saying, hey, you know, you just got to figure this out on your own, um, because it's one thing to require someone to track and report their data. It's another to tell them that they have to meet certain benchmarks down the road. And so we, um, the, this type of policy is typically called a building energy performance standard or a performance standard. Um, they're becoming more and more common, but it certainly does require, it, it's very helpful to have a benchmarking process in place because you then don't necessarily need to require that much else in terms of reporting you can just use that same policy, um, but it does change a little bit of what they have to report. They have to demonstrate that they're meeting certain benchmarks um, along the way. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and then I guess the other theme that I wanted um, us to talk about, because um, it seemed to me it was um, more in your memo than in your report just now, and that's the need for uh, dedicated funding and financing um, because um, to really make any headway on the climate crisis, we need to be able to have more, give you more, res more resources to be able to um, make an impact. And so I looked, you gave us a link to, the, to Denver and to Ann Arbor um, as two communities that are at least grappling with this issue. I, so in Denver, what they did is they, um, they appointed a climate action task force to develop um, a funding strategy, um, which they then had to put on the ballot. Because in Colorado, you can't you can't um, increase any taxes of any sort without voter approval. Um, but anyway, so the task force recommended um, a 0.25 percent sales and use tax increase to um, basically create a climate protection fund and then it was on the ballot in november and the voters approved it so they now and they're supposed to raise 40 million dollars a year what we could do with 40 million but anyway um so i don't know if if the folks that you gather together every two or three months to talk about carp implementation have have has there been any conversation there about possible um, new funding ideas, or is, or do we need to pull together some um, innovative, creative people to help us think about that? Well, I definitely think it'd be a good idea to bring bring together people, bring people together to to talk about this. Um, in the carbon coordination meetings, we haven't talked as much about funding and financing, but I have begun talking internally with city staff about different potential funding opportunities mostly have been looking at it rather than going the Denver route, but trying to look at it from more of a program area standpoint. And so saying, um, because I'm, I, I think we should be very careful about um, raising fees to yeah. socialize the cost I know. without sort of respect to who that socialization is taking place upon. And so I think there's a lot of cr really creative ways to raise funding to, to give people better options for financing so that they can go and pursue those on their own without the city necessarily needing to be that involved but then other places where the city absolutely should be involved otherwise people aren't going to be able to take advantage of a certain certain program and so um, i think it certainly takes a bit more um, analysis but i do think there's some good examples out there that we could look at and i continue to meet with our budget coordinator in particular um, to talk about to talk about some ideas 
because it'd obviously be really great to have more resources for you. Thank you. The Alderman Fisk. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Kumar. Um, so uh, one of the things that I've been really interested in, um, there's uh, you know, new data uh, coming out about the effect of uh, downtown and shopping and uh, just our, the health of our downtown and filling the vacant storefronts. And I really, I really want to tie, and I think you're actually the one working on tying together economic development, um, climate, and and attracting new buildings. So what we're what I think we're coming down to uh, identifying is that the shoppers in our downtown are not necessarily the residents of the downtown or the Northwestern students. They're the uh, folks who are in our office buildings. And obviously they've been absent during COVID. So it's been a, a perfect time to sort of look at the impact or the loss of them. I am firmly of the belief that we, if we identify new construction and attract new office buildings in healthy, safe, and climate-friendly office buildings, we will draw from downtown Chicago and help provide some of the revenue that we want to pay for all of these wonderful things that we're doing, but also support our downtown and our local businesses. And so I, I really want to uh, have a discussion. It could start with you, it could start um, anywhere, but um, how all these things are tied together. I've been really interested in uh, the opportunity that exists here for us, and I'm excited about it. And I think it may be a piece that we're, that we haven't paid as much attention to as, as we could have. So that's, I, I, I think, I'm encouraged by um, certainly about the prospect um, and your help on that would be just really useful to me. So you, you can tell me if I'm if I'm off base or anything, but that's that's sort of the early early view that I'm seeing from this that we're we're in a unique position to be able to draw in the kind of dollars that we need to help support this program through careful, um, targeted development. I, I think what I certainly would agree with is that um, if we can align our policies to make that type of uh, development, um, uh, you know, easy and, and very accessible, then I, and then I think you're absolutely right. Um, but there, there probably, there's some things we certainly would need to do to make it easier for the type of buildings that we're talking about um, to be able to, um, be successful in Evanston. Any other questions or comments for Kumar? All right, well, thank, thank you, Kumar. We're gonna go ahead then and uh, take a vote to um, accept and place your report and your update on file. Uh, it was moved and seconded. Uh, so City Clerk, could you please take the roll on SP3? Yes. Alderman Rainey. Aye. Alderman Fleming. Aye. Alderman Fisk. Aye. Alderman Braithwaite. Aye. Alderman Wynn. Aye. Alderman Wilson. Aye. Alderman Ruth Simmons. Aye. Alderman Suffordin. Aye. And Alderman Ravel. Aye. All right, thank you, Clerk. Uh, SP3 passes the City Council on a 9-0 to vote, and uh, the Climate Action Resilience Plan or CARP implementation uh, update is placed on file um, with the City. We're now going to move to the consent agenda. Uh, we did have the administration of public works and planning and development uh, before uh, council tonight, so I'm going to ask that the council members will take a minute and identify items they would like to remove from this agenda. Is anyone else hearing the mayor um, crackly, Going. or is that my sound? Echoing. Okay. Echoing. Am echoing or crackling? Crackling. <laughs> Sorry. Both. 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 All right. So what? Uh, I can hear you guys, so why don't you let me know and then I may go off and then come back on and have the definition. 
Okay. D4, would you remove? Okay. I understand A10 was pulled off the agenda in APW, so that is not on the agenda, right? Right. Okay. Alderman Sufferton, what about the three in um, APW? Yeah, the A10 was the only one. The other ones that we pulled were all. All right. Didn't have no votes, right? We just had discussion. Yep. Okay. And then key four is only for introduction, not for action. Right. Um, Mr. Mayor, that was the only reason I removed that from the agenda. If it doesn't have to be. No. It can stay on. on. I, it, pardon me? It can stay on, I think. Okay, then let's leave it on. Yes, Alderman, yeah. Alderman Fisk requested, uh, she she rescinded her request for suspension of the rules. So it's just for introduction. We've recorded P4 just for introduction tonight. Yeah, so we can just stay on consent. Okay. All right, so I don't have anything coming off right now. Then. All right, so I move the consent agenda. Second. All right. Um, city clerk, could you take a roll, please? Am I still cracking, cracking up? Yes. yes. Okay. So, um, Alderman Rainey, can you call a vote on this? I'm going to log off and log back on. Can you do what? Call the question or call on, on the consent agenda, and yes. then if I'm not back on, do call awards. All right. Grace. Well, now it's working for you. So, yeah, it sounds good. Now, now I'm back. Now I'm back. Yep. All, right. <laughs> All right. All right. So we had a motion in a second to move the consent agenda. Uh, Clerk Reed, could you please take the roll in the consent agenda? Yes, Alderman Rainey. Aye. Alderman Fleming. Aye. Alderman Fisk. Aye. Alderman Braithwaite? Aye. Alderman Wynn? Aye. Alderman Wilson? Aye. Alderman Ruth Simmons? Aye. Alderman Sofferton? Aye. Alderman and Alderman Ravel? Aye. All right, thank you, Clerk Reed. The consent agenda passes the Evanston City Council on a nine to zero vote. Um, we had uh, no items that were removed from the agenda other than A10 stayed in committee. So we're now going to move to um, call of the wards. We'll start with Alderman Rainey tonight. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I wanted to also, I didn't get a chance earlier to uh, congratulate uh, Kimberly Richardson in her just wide array of uh, talents. Um, you can be on a Zoom call at eight o'clock in the morning and she's there with just unbelievable uh, information and at 10 o'clock at night she's there also so thank you for your contribution to the city it's amazing um, also I want to thank Edgar Cano um, Kevin Johnson and Mr. Daniels they have done an amazing job along with their crew most of whom I do not know their names but I see their faces every day and um, you cannot thank them enough for the work that they do. I, I hear them out there at five o'clock in the morning and you know early in the morning. So thank you very much. Um, I want to uh, congratulate and wish good wishes uh, to my colleague Don Wilson tomorrow. Um, hope you do well. Oh, that was nice. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you, Alderman Rainey. Um, let's see, Alderwoman Fleming. I uh, just want to remind my four voters to get out and vote tomorrow um, for the two races that they can vote for in the primary. Thank you. Alderman Fisk. Yes, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Uh, first board meeting 
uh, Tuesday, March 2nd, so a week from tomorrow at 7 p.m. Uh, the agenda will be out a little bit later this week, and I hope you all can join us. Uh, a huge shout out to Erica Storley and her staff for the amazing job of moving the most snow I have ever seen um, arrive in such a short period of time. So I don't know how you did it, but it, it was amazing, and traffic for the most part is is moving even on Ridge Avenue. Um, yeah, absolutely. That, that's pretty. That's pretty remarkable. So thank you all very much, and please pass that along. I hope that uh, all of our crews did find hotel rooms for the nights where they spent 24 hours on call and uh, just did a great job. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Alderman Braithwaite. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I also want to join in uh, in thanking Edgar and his and his amazing staff, uh, as well as the residents that took the time to uh, provide feedback. A ton of snow, um, and Edgar and your staff, I mean, whenever I called, uh, you you were able to manage the situation within 24 hours, so special thanks to that. Um, I also wanna make a referral to our staff. Uh, Erica, and we've discussed this. I wanna take a close look at the possibility of residents being able to uh, pay their mortgage or purchase a house using a Section 8 voucher. This is a conversation that I've had with uh, Rob Anthony, who is the executive director of uh, CEPA, as well as uh, Sarah Flex. And I just wanna look into that and see if we're able to uh, make that happen, particularly with the discussion tonight of tiny homes, given the fact that we have communicated through reports as well as uh, feedback from our residents that there is a limited stock of uh, condos and, and housing units under the $200,000 margin. Thank you. Thank you. Alderman Wynn. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, and my thanks also to Edgar Kano, his team, his crew, to Erica Storley, to all of the city staff who have worked so hard to um, get us through this uh, February. I have heard from several people who have driven, who, who don't live in uh, Evanston, but who work here, that the when you cross the border between Chicago and Evanston, you are entering a different world. And, <laughs> Uh, I, I have not been down to Chicago to hear to, to witness it myself, but I have heard that many times. And uh, I think our um, staff and crew have done a really terrific job. Thank you. Thank you. Alderman Wilson. Uh, and I'm gonna second what uh, everybody said about the snow and uh, Alderman when I actually have been in Chicago. And it's interesting because uh, they actually seem to have less snow on the ground than we have. So. Uh, just as far as, you know, looking in a yard, uh, it's, uh, it's stunning. But, you know, two points I want to really uh, highlight here. One is the fire hydrants. Um, I know that the fire department in our, um, the city has, has reached out to people in the community uh, that if you have the wherewithal to do so, if you can help dig out those fire hydrants. And I understand from talking to some of the firefighters that uh, at the location of the Seward fire a couple of nights ago or a few nights ago, that hydrant, I guess, had just been dug out probably hours before uh, the fire had happened. And it's one of those things where, uh, you know, it might take a few guys, you know, a few minutes to dig out the fire hydrant. However, a few minutes is all the difference in the world when you're talking about your home, um, it, you know, being engulfed in flames or, you know, your loved ones potentially being trapped. So, uh, yeah, if you can do that, get those hydrants dug out. And then the other thing that always stresses me out is, you know, don't walk on the ice, right? Like it, it, it seems solid, but I keep going down to the lake and in the area and I see people walking out on those ice uh, uh, formations. And, you know, you're not just putting yourself at risk, but you are putting the people uh, who are gonna be tasked with trying to rescue you at, uh, in great danger. So, you know, please be mindful of that and, and respect those, those conditions. Um, Alderman Rainey, thanks back at you. Uh, uh, and um, I'll see everybody in a couple weeks. Thank you, Alderman. Uh, Alderwoman Ruth Simmons. I don't, I don't see her. I knew she was here earlier. Maybe she had to jump off. All right, we'll come back to her. She comes back on. Alderman Suffern. 
Sure. Uh, I just want to say thank you, like everyone else has. I asked Edgar for a list of names of people to thank, and he said he was afraid he would leave somebody out, so he chose not to. So I'd like to thank Public Works, Community Facilities, Parking Enforcement, Police, 311, Property Standards, City Manager's Office, Community Engagement, and Health, uh, and then also Wynn Schauber from the library, who did not yep. have to do with snow removal, but is a very nice person. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman. Um, all right. I think that that wraps up our call of the wards. Uh, we do not have executive. Oh, excuse me. Alderman Rebell. Alderman Rebell. I said Alderman Rain. Yeah. Oh, well, I don't want to miss my chance to say thank you to um, Edgar Kano and his crew for the amazing um, job they've been doing for us, um, clearing all that snow. And then I also wanted to uh, say a big thank you to Mary O'Connor for um, her wonderful leadership in bringing this um, floral um, floral heart project and memorial to Evanston and creating a space for um, residents to um, have a chance to uh, come come you know meet with with their family members um, to remember loved ones that they've lost. It'll be really meaningful um, to have that installation for um, two or three days. Um, so. She, and not only is she bringing it to Evanston, she's really working to bring it to communities around the country. So she's just um, been doing an amazing job. Thank you, Alder Roman. And, uh, and we will make sure we get information out about that on the Thursday update this week so our residents know as well. All right, so we do not have executive session tonight. Our next meeting of the City Council will be two weeks from today. I believe that's March 8th. Um, and uh, I will take a motion to adjourn if people are ready. I'll move. I'll move. All right, is there a second? second. All right. Uh, City Clerk, could you take the roll to adjourn? Yes. Alderman Rainey? Aye. Alderman Fleming? Aye. Alderman Fisk? Aye. Alderman Braithwaite? Aye. Alderman Wynn? Aye. Alderman Wilson? Aye. Alderman Marie Simmons. Oh, okay. Alderman Safford. Aye. And uh, Alderman Ravel. Aye. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Clerk. And uh, so on an eight to zero vote, uh, the Evanston City Council is now adjourned. Have a nice evening, everyone. And we'll see you in two weeks. Bye bye.